Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Kangas. I'm a critical care anesthesiologist alongside my good friend and colleague, Dr. Frank Bakowitz, a cardiothoracic surgeon. We're here at Wayne State University in the Detroit Medical Center. We thank the SCS for the opportunity to participate in the eight and eight series. Today, we'd like to talk about one of my favorite topics, point of care ultrasound, specifically the post-operative hypotensive patient. One thing I wanna emphasize is that point of care ultrasound or POCUS can absolutely save lives. It's a quick, non-invasive technique to recognize and diagnose a variety of differentials and can be performed by various specialties in the healthcare team. You don't need to be an intensivist or cardiologist to use this tool. As time goes on, ultrasounds are becoming smaller and less expensive. Some are even pocket-sized that can plug into our phones. For time purposes, we can't go over how to obtain all the views and windows, but instead I wanna focus on some of the most common causes of hypotension in the post-operative patient and how bedside ultrasound can help us manage these patients. So let's get started. Probably the most common cause of post-operative hypertension is hypovolemia or low preload. There's new technologies like SVV and bedside exams like passive leg raises that can help us determine a patient's fluid status, but these often have limitations. I found bedside echocardiography to be one of the most effective and consistent ways to assess fluid status. On the left, we see a parasternal short axis view of a patient's left ventricle here. To assess fluid status, we need to look at two things, end systolic volume and end diastolic volume. We can clearly see the patient on the left has a low end systolic volume kissing ventricles, seen here. Uh, this can occur as a result of hypovolemia or even af low afterload. To differentiate, we need to look at end diastolic volume, which in this case is low. Usually uh, an LV diameter of less than four centimeters suggests hypovolemia, which we can see here end diastolic volume less than four centimeters, so this patient is likely hypovolemic. If we simply move the probe to the abdomen to assess the IVC, pictured here on the right, this is the intrahepatic IVC going to the right atrium, and we see it is very collapsible with respirations. So if you have a hypotensive patient with images like this, then you should be reaching for the crystalloid or colloid before your inotropes or pressors. Another common cause of hypotension, especially in the post-bypass patient, is low afterload or vasoplegia. Here, we have another short axis view of a patient's heart, this time with a history of vegetations and bacteremia. Uh, this echo may look similar to the previous hypovolemic patient, but if you look closely, you can see that even though the patient has a low end systolic volume, kissing ventricles, um, just as the previous patient, here we have a normal end diastolic volume in the LV, which as I mentioned, is greater than four centimeters in diameter. Together with this history and imaging, we should be starting vasoconstrictors such as norepinephrine or vasopressin before excessive fluid administration or inotropes. Another useful feature of POCUS is assessing a patient's ventricular function. Here we have two separate patients, say both are post bypass in the ICU, but have very different looking hearts. These are both apical four chamber views using TTE. On the left, we have a normal functioning ventricles, LV here and RV here. We know their normal functioning by looking at the myocardium. In this case, we have greater than 30% thickening and in inward movement of the myocardium towards the cavity of the LV. So this suggests normal function. On the right, we have a severely reduced EF. Uh, we have very minimal thickening of the patient's myocardium and very little movement towards the, the cavity of the ventricle. Um, if this patient were hypotensive, the best course of action would be to reach for the inotropes like epinephrine or dibutamine as opposed to aggressive fluid resuscitation or vasoconstrictors. One point I wanna make clear is that it isn't necessary to specifically quantify a patient's ejection fraction. Just knowing whether the cardiac function is normal or severely abnormal is all that's required to adjust your management and hopefully improve your patient's outcomes. A less discussed cause of hemodynamic instability is the right ventricle. This can be easily assessed by POCUS. Here on the left, we have a parasternal short axis view of the heart we can clearly see a severely dilated RV anterior to a normal functioning LV, but we can see something else. This is called the D sign, which is interventricular septal flattening during systole. Um, this is a result of elevated RV pressures exceeding LV pressures. It can be a result of pulmonary hypertension or even pulmonary embolisms. So in this patient, I would consider acutely decreasing your pulmonary pressures and maybe sending down for stat CTPE. On the right is a great example of a patient with, who was over resuscitated that led to acute RV failure. This patient was hypotensive and required massive transfusion intraoperatively to come off pump. 
we see a severely dilated RV here and a hypokinetic RV with a low volume in the LV. If you give this patient more fluid, that is likely only to worsen his hemodynamic status. An inodilator like milrinone to improve RV contractility and reduce pulmonary vascular resistance may be a better choice to push the blood from the RV to the LV. Another potential cause of hypotension after heart surgery is cardiac tamponade. Pericardial fluid can often develop after routine open heart surgery, but to know if it's causing hemodynamic compromise, this is where echocardiography can be an invaluable tool. On the top left, we see a parasternal long axis view of the heart with a layer of fluid around it. This fluid is unlikely causing hemodynamic compromise because we see no sign of RV or RA collapse. However, here on the right, we have evidence of cardiac tamponade. This top right image is a parasternal long axis view which is clearly demonstrating RV collapse, which is a sign of elevated pericardial fluid pressures, which leads to a low preload state. On the bottom right, we have an apical four chamber view demonstrating clear right atrial collapse, another sign of elevated pericardial pressures. These patients need IV fluids and emergent evacuation of the pericardial fluid. You shouldn't waste time adjusting pressors in these cases. Lastly, we're going to mention lung ultrasound, specifically how we can use it to help diagnose pneumothorax. Say you have a patient uh, that you think has a pneumothorax after placement of a central line. You place a linear probe on their chest and you might see an image like this. Here are the ribs on either side of the pleural line. The pleural line is where the visceral and parietal parietal pleural come in contact with each other. Here we can clearly see lung sliding, also called ants marching sign. This is when the visceral and parietal pleura slide along one another during respirations. If you see this image, then you know the patient does not have a pneumothorax in this area of the lung. However, if you place the probe on the patient's chest and see this image, this is the pleural line, and we see no lung sliding or no ants marching along the pleural line, then the, poten uh, the patient could have a potential pneumothorax. If the patient were acutely hypotensive, perhaps a needle thoracostomy or chest tube placement may be warranted. The best part is you didn't have to wait for the x-ray team to come by. In conclusion, point of care ultrasound is a quick and non-invasive tool to help physicians narrow the differential diagnosis in a hypotensive patient. Most importantly, this is something we all can do. You don't need years of fellowship training or multiple certifications to get these images and start helping your patients today. Thank you for listening. 